Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fuqua School of Business Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, in just, uh, just a few moments, we'll get started with a conversation with uh, Mary Barra. Uh, Mary is a great friend of Duke University and of the business school. She's been kind enough to uh, make an appearance in the, in the Distinguished Speaker Series multiple times. Of course, GM is moving uh, at, uh, and I'll be asking her about this, at ventilator speed. Uh, which means that much has changed since her, her last appearance. But Mary is one of, uh, one of the finest leaders that I've ever had the personal uh, pleasure and privilege of, of uh, meeting. And so I'm expecting to have just a, a fantastic conversation. And so, uh, so Mary, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Bill. It's really great to, to be here and to be virtually back with uh, Fuqua School of Business. So uh, let me let me start with a, a softball, which is uh, uh, you now you now have two uh, two kids uh, who enrolled at Duke as in in the undergraduate program. One is already graduated. One will be graduating very soon uh, in the upcoming graduation. And so my my and you of course now sit on the the, the Duke Board of Trustees. So. Uh, my my question is, how is it that your your family came to fall in love with Duke University? Well, it started um, when my son wanted to study biomedical engineering. And as you know, Duke has a very, very good biomedical engineering program. So as he looked at a handful of schools, Duke um, rose to the top of that list. And uh, once we saw it, and then we got involved in the parents committee, and we had to remind ourselves that we weren't Duke alum, uh, my husband and I, after we had served about a year or two on the parents committee, uh, my daughter came down to visit my son and um, also really, you know, just Duke is such a special place, uh, the campus, the culture, uh, the, the academic rigor, the sporting events, and so Lo and behold, now I sit, like you say, with uh, one graduate and one soon-to-be graduate. So I'm, I'm so glad I, I have the opportunity and the honor to serve on the Board of Trustees, because that means uh, my time there hasn't ended. <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the conversation uh, about COVID, uh, but I, I want to start uh, more towards where we are right now. And, uh, and get you to talk a little bit about the, the plans that you have uh, at GM, which actually mirrors the changes that you made with the dress code. Uh, my understanding is that you inherited a 10 page dress code uh, that you reduced to two words, dress appropriately. Is that story actually true? Well, you know, I, I actually can't remember, was it 10 pages, was it 12, but it was over 10 pages. And, you know, uh, dress appropriately was re really communicating to everyone. I mean, first of all, we have people that do so many different things. We have over 160,000 people at uh, General Motors across the globe, people who work in our manufacturing plants, in warehouses, with our dealerships, interfacing with government, all different uh, aspects. And, you know, the, the basic thought was, we're trusting you to do really good work on, on behalf of General Motors. Why can't we trust you to dress, to know how to dress appropriately for your position? And so it was really about a power, empowering everyone, but also holding everyone accountable. So you're now using very similar language as, as we move uh, into the, the time zone where people can start coming back to work. And so uh, you've now created the phrase work appropriately. So can you can you explain how that's going to work as we transition hopefully into uh, some kind of post-COVID environment? Sure. Well, um, you know, for at General Motors, because we have, you know, manufacturing operations, we have R&D labs and we have design centers. After um, people uh, got through the mandated shutdowns that were mandated by countries around the world or states, um, different regions, 
we wanted to get uh, our people who needed to be at work to do their work back as quickly as possible. And I'm really proud of the global lessons learned that allowed us to bring people back safely uh, with social distance, distancing, masks, sanitizing areas. And we've successfully had people back at work for, you know, since last May. And I have to tell you, our, our, some of our operations in Korea and other places never really shut down. And so we took all those lessons and got people back to work who needed to be there to do their work. We also, though, had a lot of our team working from home and doing that quite successfully. But what we've realized, you know, we made it work and, you know, hats off to everything that the team accomplished over this last year from working from home. But, you know, people are missing out on collaboration on what I call casual mentoring or learning or just, you know, that asking that person next to you who's been doing the in the role for longer and, and learning from them. And so what we've rolled out just a couple of weeks ago is what we're now calling work appropriately, as you said. And it's really for those people who have the flexibility uh, to work from home for all the time or a portion of the time for it to really be uh, not about what a senior leader wants or what a manager wants or what the employee wants, but it's how do we enable people to do their best work in whatever environment that facilitates that? Recognizing at times there may need to, to be at work for uh, collaboration or, or other events, but really also, so it's empowering people, but it also then creates an environment to hold them accountable. And for our people who need to be at work to do their work, because what we overwhelmingly heard from the people who had been working from home, many of them said, hey, I wanna come back in the office, but I like the flexibility that I have. And so we're even looking at ways that we can give our people who need to be at work to do their work flexibility, whether it's uh, bringing on more resources. So if people are you know, working seven days a week, they can get some time off, letting them do training at home, uh, providing uh, more uh, you know, computer equipment. So things that they could do from home, they're able to do from home. So, and what we've also told everybody is, look, we're gonna start down this path and we're gonna learn, and then we're going to adjust. But it's really about empowerment and accountability and trying to provide flexibility in different ways, depending on the job. Okay, so uh, so let me back up to the beginning of the of the COVID crisis, and uh, it, you were in a position <clears throat> faced by so many uh, facing a simultaneous crisis in terms of an economic crisis, and you had to make sure that you conserved your resources, that you maintain liquidity, uh, that you held on to jobs for your workforce. Uh, then, of course, uh, you also fa face a significant health crisis, not only in terms of looking out for the health and safety of your workforce, but stepping up to do things that would protect the health and safety of communities outside of GM. And then there's this uh, crisis of social justice, racial equity and justice. So uh, can you walk us through uh, let, let's pick those one at a time. And so uh, the economic crisis, I, I think people are buying cars and trucks now. So is, has, that, uh, has that dimension of the crisis really become less pressing for you? Absolutely. And actually, um, sales came back um, in many places around the world, clearly the United States and, and China, much more quickly than we actually thought they would. And I think people realized um, with you know, the aspects of COVID, having your own personal transportation was really important. So uh, we saw sales rebound rather quickly. And actually, um, uh, even through some of the, the more serious months, um, but, but we, uh, so we were able to get through the, the financial piece of it, but we really started with focusing on how do we keep our employees safe and our customers safe? Yeah. So, uh, so tell me about some of the challenges that, that you face because you, you, you needed to keep producing these cars and trucks when people, uh, your, your customers needed these products. So uh, what, what was most difficult about bringing people into work in that environment? Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, we had, you know, as, as we all know, the coronavirus started in, in Asia and China, then Korea, and as it moved through Europe and then to the United States, and because we have operations in all of those locations, we started learning, and we formed a global task force, and as we had to shut down in the United States, 
that team immediately went to work. The day we, you know, sent everyone home, we started working on what is it going to take to get everyone back safely and how could we safely support our customers. And so we really developed in it, uh, protocols from all the learnings we had around the globe. In the United States, actually, you know, the United Auto Workers, our, our labor unions pulled all the companies together and said, let's get one standard that we can all keep in continuously improving. And so all companies work together. And we successfully, about um, six weeks, eight weeks later, we were able to bring people back to work following masking, social distancing. In some cases, we had to rearrange operations. And like I said, I'm proud to say that we were able to do that um, with a very uh, strong track record of not having facility spread of the virus. Similarly, with our, um, in our dealerships, we worked with our dealers to enable much of the transaction to be done online, if not all of it online, to have home delivery. And some of our dealers were doing that already, but we really accelerated to the future of what customers want in that space. But also um, in what were the right san uh, you know, sanitizing and environment to repair people's vehicles and or to sell them new vehicles uh, if they had a need. And so we went through all of, of that. And then, um, of course, when people came back, as we all know, there was a wide range. There were people who were like, I'm fine. Let me get back to work. I'll wear the mask. There were people who were like, I'm not so sure. So what we did across the globe is uh, regional leaders went and visited every one of our facilities. So uh, because, as we all know, global travel is still difficult. Uh, I, was, I traveled uh, between myself, my president, and our head of manufacturing. Um, we traveled to every single facility, not to look at the operations, but to talk to the team to say, mm -hmm. do you feel safe? How can we make this environment even safer? And um, you know, quickly, they found ways, of course, to make the protocols even better. And they were safely back at work and continue operating under those protocols today. So that was kind of the safety challenge. Um, clearly, uh, as we shut down operations, uh, we had to make sure we were protected and we had a strong balance sheet, and we did that. And then once we got past that, we kind of had a two-pronged um, where we were working on accelerating our transformation to a, a you know a zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion world. But also then doing something that I'm incredibly proud of, General Motors, you know, through our more than hundred-year history. When the country needed us, General Motors came, answered the call. And whether it was PPE, um, you know, making uh, mass lines that are still in operations today, uh, to making ventilators, um, the team stepped up. So I couldn't be more proud. So uh, COVID has actually been a period of enormous innovation for GM. And, uh, and so I wanna, I wanna come to that and, and back to my comment about ventilator speed. Uh, but one, one thing I'm struck by is that as we think about the pandemic, it's in large measure, it's given globalism uh, a bad name as we see, oh, well, if we could just shut down borders, we wouldn't have this, this spread. And yet the story you told is one of the, the upside of globalism, that because you have operations around the world, you could learn best practices and be prepared as the pandemic made its way around the world. And so, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I presume you remain happy that, that, that GM is a global company. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's been a lot of questions about supply chain, and we're always looking at our supply chain to make sure uh, we're managing it appropriately. Uh, you know, obviously, there's some you know, geopolitical risk right now that we need to deal with um, and make sure that we're well positioned. But, you know, we're talking to governments around the world to make sure they understand, like so many industries, the auto industry isn't alone, of how complex our supply chains really are. So uh, back to this ventilator speed notion, uh, if I have it right, it, it refers to the fact that you actually did kind of break down bureaucracy and, and were able to manufacture ventilators in, in just uh, <laughs> record speed. Uh, and... Tell me about the stickiness of this, because this is a concept that lives on a GM that applies to all of your business now, that you know, what if, what's going to be sticky coming out of this crisis that will allow you to be better as you move forward faster, more nimble, more agile? Sure. Well, across the business, uh, we saw people looking at, you know, what, what do we need to do to, to move things quickly? So, you know, 
processes that would take two weeks because everyone thought they had an approval right, we found getting done in half a day because the you know the right people were there and made the call and, and got it done. And so that kind of empowerment, we're really trying to make sure no one reverts back. Ventilator leader speed though was something pretty special because uh, the ventilator, there's a lot of different um, uh, complexity depending on what kind of ventilator you're talking about. The ventilator that General Motors partnered with Ventec uh, to help make. Ventec was making about 250 to 300 ventilators a month, and it was really kind of a bench build. We wanted, they wanted, the government wanted um, to ramp that up. And so we set a target, let's get this to 10,000 ventilators a month. Um, so we had to leverage uh, people from across the company, uh, whether it was engineering, purchasing and supply chain, manufacturing, uh, safety, quality, uh, all different parts of the company came together. And about the, the issue, one issue was we just had to apply, I'll say, mainstream mass production techniques. But the other thing was, you know, we knew that there was a supply base challenge because many of the components that had been sourced by Ventec for 250 a month, those suppliers couldn't jump up to 10,000. So I also have to give tremendous credit to the automotive supply base. Our team got, we got a call, two days later, they were on a plane at Ventec over the weekend, they sent out a, a, a massive, um, you know, kind of open sourcing saying, who can make, here's all the parts we need, who can make them? Within a few days, the, uh, for the ones that uh, we needed a new supplier, which was about half of them. So think about 300 parts, suppliers said, I can make that part. And then we're like, great, we need you to be at rate or helping us accelerate 30 days from now. And they answered the call. And then, you know, uh, as we started to ramp up, we had to lay out production processes. And one of the interesting stories is we learned there was a part in the, in the ventilator that Ventec had some challenges with. It was kind of a bottleneck. It was very similar to a transmission. So we brought in our best transmission engineers. They helped redefine or redesign that part to make it more robust from a, a assembly perspective, but also from a quality perspective. And 30 days later, we were building ventilators in a new um, you know, revamped facility in Kokomo, Indiana, with people who had volunteered saying, I'll come back from, from you know, the leave I'm on to be a part of making ventilators for our country because our country needs us. And the local community came in as well. We had to train them, uh, you know, so there was a whole training plan. But I was there when that first uh, ventilator was coming off the line and it came off the line 100% first time quality and it was one of the proudest moments. And it was, everybody was focused on how do we do this well? Because we knew we were making a device if there was any quality issues, you know, it, it, it's a life-saving device. So it has to be, has to be 100% right, but how can we break down roadblocks and, and get it faster? And the team did amazing things. And frankly, we just got out of their way. And uh, so now we talk about that as ventilator speed. When we talk about, well, why is that gonna take six months if we could, source and create a whole new production process and make ventilators. Now it was designed to be fair. Um, why can't we go faster? And the team has really embraced it. So when you ask somebody, can't you do it faster ventilator speed? It's kind of like, it turns on a light bulb to say, well, you're right. I got to challenge every aspect to see why I can't go faster. And that's what's allowed us to take time out of our vehicle development process to get electric vehicles on the road more quickly. And it's, it's applying across many areas of the business. So to, to jump onto that, uh, you've gotten a lot of press around your ability to bring some, some innovation to market much more quickly than usual. For example, uh, the, the Hummer EV uh, pickup, I guess, the, the SUV will come later, but that's actually going to hit market this fall. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. And, and is, that, is that the Hummer that can go uh, zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds? I think it's around three. So it's pretty okay. fast. It's one also, it's got crab walk. Um, it's, it's got extract mode. Um, you know, I think what I love about the GMC Hummer EV truck is it's a super truck. You know, a truck person isn't really giving anything up, the capability, taking all the knowledge we have because General Motors knows how to make great trucks and putting that on uh, an electric propel, propel, propelled truck is what we've done. But what enabled that is, and most people don't realize, for three years prior, we had been working on a dedicated EV platform that can do anything from a small SUV all the way up to a, uh, to a sports car, to a super truck. 
And mm. the fact that we had done that engineering and now really have an EV platform that's kind of got a building block approach to do different size vehicles, different performance vehicles, that's what enab is enabling us to go so fast. Mm. Interesting. So, uh, so I want to come back to this idea of being fast as you innovate. Uh, I think it was three years ago that, that you told me that the GM is all about electrification, uh, uh, ride sharing, uh, and, and autonomous uh, cars. And those were kind of the three things you, you, you said GM is basically a Silicon Valley company. And I think if anything, you've doubled down on, uh, on those areas. So I want to come back to that. But I want to return to the pandemic uh, and the, the crisis of social justice. You've been, uh, you've been very outspoken in saying what you think GM needs to do in this space. And you've actually been uh, front and center for the business, the business of business um, in the sense of you are chairing a special committee for the business roundtable uh, that, that's focused on racial equity and justice. So can you, can you help us understand like what, what do you think you, you need to do? What are you trying to do within GM? And then I wanna broaden that to what is, what is the role of the platform of business in addressing these issues in society? Sure. Well, there, there's so many things we need to do, but I think it starts with, um, and, and what we looked at is we, we aspire to be the most inclusive company in the world, but it's not a title we want to hold by ourselves. We want everyone to aspire because that's the world we want to live in. And when I get people who kind of challenge me on it, I say, look, at, the, at its core, it means that when everyone comes to work, they're valued for who they are. They can be their true self and they can feel valued for the contribution they make. And when you take it down to that basic level of valuing everybody, valuing their differences, making them feel welcomed and that they have a sense of belonging so they can do their best work. You know, and I look at people and say, why would we want it any other way? And if we don't have that, and you know, we, we after um, uh, the George Floyd, uh, uh, you know, the whole environment that, you know, followed so many other people, but kind of came to a, to, I think, a, a tipping point or an awakening with, with uh, George Floyd's death. I think that's when we looked and said, okay, we've got to look at ourselves and say, I'm, I'm very proud of all the different places where General Motors has led from a diversity and inclusion perspective, but we realized we had more to do if we wanted that environment where everyone felt like they belonged. And, and we started by listening. We had listening sessions with many different employees and we learned we had a way to go. And we're now systematically working in many different areas of the company uh, and learning and listening. And there's, you know, there's times where we think we're doing it right. And then, you know, we get some pushback and we're like, okay, help me understand what your perspective is. Yet, yeah, you know, you're right. We need to look at how we're doing this, how we're awarding this business, how we're enabling small versus large because we're such a big company. And so we feel that's on the journey to being the most inclusive, which frankly we think is a journey that will never end. And so um, that's at its core. One of General Motors' uh, three corporate pillars for, or corporate giving pillars is education. And this relates to my work on BRT because I'm responsible for the uh, Workforce and Education Committee along with so many other talented and dedicated CEOs, but I lead that team right now. And education, and you know, talking at an educational institution, uh, if everyone doesn't have the same opportunity with education, I mean, we, we now, I mean, I've learned a lot. And if you're not reading, you know, up until age three, age, or excuse me, grade three, you're learning to read. Past grade three, you're reading, um, reading to learn. If you don't master reading by grade three, you know, there's all these longitudinal studies that it really impacts that individual's, that child's future. So how do we um, improve our education systems? How do we improve you know, pre-K? How do we uh, allow people into the workforce that um, maybe don't have a degree, but have the, have the skill sets? And so more skills-based and that education can continue. And so there's so many things that we're unlocking that we think corporate America can do to support the local communities. I mean, I, almost every company I know and, and the people I work with, they're all very involved in their local communities, working on education or economic development. And so we're trying to leverage all the best practices and experiences to make more progress more quickly. 
So uh, you, you've probably seen this statistic, but it turns out that the, the most trusted institution uh, to tackle issues of, of racial justice is your employer. And so, uh, so again, it seems like this is a moment in time when, when maybe the business community can make more progress in this space than say politicians might. Well, I think um, I think we definitely feel um, that we have a role to play, and and because you know I, I think it, when you look at the the issues around education, there's been many administrations that have put a lot of effort into tackling it, and you know the bottom line is it's hard. It's hard to to tackle some of the issues that are creating an educational system um, in this country and in others that does not have you know the same opportunity, and so um, you know we think. I believe, and I think many members of the BRT believe that we do have a very important role to play. Government has a role to play at all levels, you know, at the federal level, at the state level, speaking of this, this, um, uh, this country, we also can learn a lot. I mean, when you look at Europe and you know, specifically Germany and, and how they have a very different um, development model for some of the, the, what we call trades, but are really very important jobs in, in, in our highly respected jobs because not everyone wants to sit at a desk. Some people want to work with their hands. We need all of those people and they need to be equally valued. So um, business feels we do have a very important role to play. So do you think that uh, as someone who, who grew up in a or professionally grew up in a male dominated industry uh, as one of the few women, uh, do you think that that's made you more sensitive to these issues of, of equity and conclusion and inclusion and given you, you know, more, more to draw from as you tackle these issues? No, I, um, I, my brother and I were first generation college. My parents were both very uh, smart people, but didn't have the opportunity to go to college. Uh, but they believed in the American dream and they kind of taught us. Uh, you know, especially, um, you know, being the only girl, I was always taught you can be anything you want to be if you work hard. And so, you know, I, as I entered the business world, I didn't necessarily look at it from a gender perspective. What I've learned, though, there are so many young girls though, that say or, or people of many different backgrounds that say, if I don't see someone who looks like me, I'm not sure I can ever get there. And so, you know, my, I had fabulous parents. My mother just drove it into me. You can be anything you want to be. So I feel very fortunate that I had that kind of, of support and encouragement through my whole life. Um, but I, I think as I step back and look and I've learned a lot, I do think that, um, you know, I, but I don't think it's because I'm a woman. I think it's because what I've been exposed to and frankly, the learning I've been able to, to um, do in the different roles I've had, that there is more that we can do to provide that equity and provide that inclusion. So what, what advice do you have for people who, who want to promote more equitable, more inclusive environments? What, what are some of the, the, the skills and capabilities that you think are critical to, to driving a, a, a company culture in that direction? Well, I think it, it for me, it definitely starts with listening, because I, I have to tell you, as an engineer, I'm a problem solver. So um, uh, but before you start solving a problem, you have to make sure you really understand the problem. And like I said, as we started this journey last summer, I realized I had a, I had a lot to learn um, of, you know, how people felt and how maybe um, systems were set up or what the perception was of systems. And so, you know, we we went on a journey of listening to to make sure we take the right steps. And it's, it wasn't a one and done. It's something we repeatedly do and say, OK, we're going to do this. Let's see, you know, what impact does that have and continue to ask for feedback. And we're also encouraging across the company to have those conversations, have, you know, when you don't understand or when someone you someone says something that you feel is insensitive invest in them to help them understand why what they said made you feel a certain way. And, um, and we, we start meetings, many meetings with either a safety message or an inclusion message, because we feel it's psychological safety. And uh, we have leaders sharing their aha moments or what they've learned and sometimes sharing things that it's kind of, it's hard to talk about because it, you have to be vulnerable. But as we continue to have those discussions, it's kind of causing everyone to open up and to be more willing to lean in. Because this is an area that you can just sit back and say nothing. 
But if we do that, we're not going to make the progress we need to make. So I'm really proud of in, in GM team members at every level leaning in. So a lot of a lot of business opportunity now and and in the future is going to be technology related. Uh, it's going to really require STEM capabilities, and uh, and we have not had that many women who've chosen to go into STEM uh, STEM fields. Uh, unlike you, you you are an engineer by training. What can we do? What what can men do? Uh, to really encourage more women to pursue these areas of education and therefore have the have opportunities that 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 uh, will will give them the ability to fulfill their aspirations. Well, I think uh, it, it first starts with that focus, that core focus, no matter what someone's going to be, I believe that they need to understand technology because there's not a single industry that isn't being impacted. So I'm not saying everyone has to code. But people shouldn't think of it as a black box and something they're scared of. So it means, you know, first of all, you can't learn STEM if you don't know how to read. And so that reading, you know, that's starting at pre-K, you know, three to make sure people are, you know, capable and students are reading at grade three. And then I think from a women's perspective, really focusing on, because there's a lot of, of research to support. Middle school is where women, young girls start to kind of back away from math and science for a whole host of reasons that you know, we could spend two hours talking about. So what we need to do is make sure that they stay focused because especially with math, once you kind of step off the math path, it's very hard to jump back on in high school and really hard in college. And so um, keeping that math science uh, focus in middle school, I think is very important. And that's why, you know, we do a lot of work with Girls Who Code and um, Black Girls Code and Code.org. Again, it's just keeping that interest in middle school where they believe they can do it and making it fun for them. Uh, because once they stay engaged, then, you know, you can keep on that track. Uh, so I think one is, you know, creating that environment that more young women, young girls, and young boys are being exposed to the, the math and science so they have a potential to choose a STEM career. But then one of the other programs we're finding is quite successful because there are women who have been in the work, work workforce, had technical degrees, technical background, technical experience, but they stepped off whether it was to raise a family, care for elderly parents, you know, spouse moved, whatever the reason, there's a really great program called Take Two, where we bring people in uh, who say, I, you know, I've been gone for two or I've been gone for 12 years. I, I can't do it. You know, generally you can. And so they do a 12 week uh, internship. And then many of them uh, launch right into a, a, a position very similar to what they were doing before they, they you know, stepped away from the workforce. In some cases, we had women applying to these programs. Where we said, you don't need to go through the 12-week program. Here's your job. Here's the position you have. And so I think it's, it's looking not only at are we you know, creating the pipeline of STEM-qualified men and women, it's also looking at uh, existing and how do we how do we bring them back to the workforce or do on the job training? So it, we're going to need many solutions to have the technical resources we're going to need, because frankly, it's already, I would say, a war on talent. So I, I want to uh, come back to a comment that you made that in, in certain areas, if, if we're really going to advance society, we need business to step forward. We need the government to step forward. We need educational institutions that, that we need this partnership. And yet we're living in a world where sometimes those players bump into each other. Uh, most recently, uh, we've seen some bumpiness in terms of what's happening in the political arena and the business arena around uh, voting rights. And so this is, a, this is an issue where you, again, took a public position. Uh, you actually joined with, I think, the CEOs of 30 other companies in Michigan uh, to take a position against proposed legislation that would change uh, voting access in Michigan. So help us understand what, what it takes to, to get you to, to make a, a public statement like that when it is bumping into the political arena. Well, I think sometimes um, things uh, get politicized that really aren't political issues. And 
Um, you know, we all live in a society where, you know, we only read the headlines and we're all guilty of it. Do we ever actually read the story? And often headlines are written and I apologize to my any journalist colleagues here, but a lot of times that headline is written to get you to click. But if you don't read the whole story, you don't really know what happened. And, you know, for many of the companies, almost every company um, that I know put a position out, it wasn't choosing a political path. It was just saying, look, a core fundamental part of our democracy is the right to vote. And so shouldn't we preserve and or enhance everyone's right to vote, full stop. And so again, it's one of those things when you really get to the essence of what people are saying, they're not taking a position on the 62 provisions in this state or that state or whatever. They're just saying, come on everyone, let's make sure we protect this fundamental right and, and you know, uh, part of our democracy of everyone having a right to vote and let's enhance it or at least protect what people have. And, um, and make, you know, and I don't think anyone was saying we don't want to have, you know, authentication or, or the right identification that, you know, people are, are voting uh, legitimately, but it was let's protect and enhance. And if that was the headline, one, you probably wouldn't have clicked on the story, but that's what most of business is trying to say. Um, so it, we don't see it as a political issue. We see it as quarter our, our democracy. And if, you know, people would look at what the corporations are actually saying, they'd see that. So um, I, I, I totally agree with the, uh, with what you said, which is this is about protecting our democracy, but it is unusual for the business world to, you know, jump into uh, this conversation about what we need to do to protect our democracy. So is there, uh, does it connect back to uh, a, a business case for, uh, for saying this is important to our country? Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, we're all proud to, to, to be in this country, or I will speak for myself, and we do see democracy as being um, core. And, you know, at General Motors, we looked at any time, we don't take a stand on everything, um, because there's places where, you know, we maybe don't have the, the knowledge experience to take a stand. But when we pledged last year to, to work to be the most inclusive company, uh, you know, we felt as part of inclusion, um, is that is that fundamental right of everyone having a right to vote? So we weren't taking as you know what kind of what I would say the corporate world was doing was asking all of the legislatures in a bipartisan manner to either preserve or enhance people's rights to vote, um, and 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 because that's e equality and that's the lead, you know is inclusion, and so. Um, you know, that, that's the way I look at it. And I think it's, it's, it is fundamental to our country. And I think it was something most businesses felt they needed to stand for, but not in a political fashion, really, you know, asking it to happen in a bipartisan fashion. Yeah, I think what, what sets business apart is that you have all kinds of people who work for your companies of all political persuasions and the business world discovered long ago how important inclusion is that we allow all these people to come together and work with common purpose. So, so I do think that, that you, you have, in, in fact, made the business case uh, for inclusion uh, with, with, with these very public uh, stands. So let me, let me switch to uh, your, your uh, innovation story again. And I'm sorry, this is so nonlinear, uh, but, um, but you, you made this public commitment, again, in terms of making public commitments to fully move to electric vehicles by 2035. And so maybe for some of the people on our call, that seems like a long ways off, but the reality is you know, that, that is not far at all in terms of making that conversion. So, um, Tell me, I know this was this is not a change in strategic direction. Uh, it's really an intensification. But but what led you to make this public commitment? Well, I think it was a number of things. Uh, you know, a couple of years back, we did uh, commit to an all electric future, and uh, and you know started on the journey. That's why you know several you know years ago we started working on the Ultium platform uh, to have the 
ability because in order for, you know, to have, believe in an all e future, you have to make sure you have EVs for everyone. So our, our, you know, how we're advertising right now is much more than an advertising campaign. It really, if you want to, you know, right now about 2% of, in the United States, about 2% of vehicles sold are electric vehicles. If, and we believe in um, the concern, concerns around climate change. And so if you're really going to change that, you can't just be selling EVs to a small niche to uh, you know people who are buying their second, third, and fourth car. You need to make EVs affordable, and then you need to make sure there's an ecosystem to support someone who they're going to buy. If they buy an EV, that's their only vehicle. So they, when they need to go somewhere farther, they can't say, "Oh, I'm going to take the other vehicle today." You've got to. So you really have to um, create that ecosystem, uh, for people to choose electric vehicles. And so that's the journey that we started on. And we are seeing customers starting to say, you know what, if it's a beautiful vehicle, if it has the right range, if it's affordable, and if there's, uh, you know, a robust charging infrastructure, yeah, I I'd consider an electric vehicle. And so we've seen much more, um, uh, I, I would say understanding and interest um, and customer acceptance of where we're moving, which uh, you know is one of the reasons we've accelerated our EV programs and made the aspiration to have all of our light duty vehicles electric by 2035. It's an aspiration. Um, so because we know to do that, it's not only the vehicles we produce, it's battery technology breakthrough to drive affordability, and it's having a robust infrastructure, charging infrastructure, not just for people so they can have a charger in their home, but what about that person who lives in an apartment who doesn't have dedicated parking? They need a solution too. And so that's the journey we're on. We see that it's possible. And, you know, uh, this is where I think at General Motors, when I talk about, when we talk about, when General Motors talks about zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion, we believe we have the responsibility uh, as well as the technology to make it a reality. And that's why we're working so hard. So you've, to, uh, to kind of be uh, honest about this, you've received some flack for the idea that you do have responsibility uh, for addressing things like climate change. And uh, shouldn't your focus simply be on maximizing shareholder value and, and profitability? And don't you have a lot of profits at stake with uh, gas powered trucks? Um, so uh, is that criticism going away? Uh, and, and how do you address that kind of criticism? I would say, first of all, what we try to do with every new internal combustion engine vehicle we put on the road, we try to make it uh, improve from a fuel economy and an emissions perspective. And so we, we work to do that with every vehicle. We also recognize if you're only selling 2% and many people can't afford electric vehicles and then also can't live their lives with today's infrastructure, we're on a journey. And how can we accelerate that journey, which is what we're working on? Uh, so you've got to have all the pieces for General Motors continuing to sell better and better trucks as we make this uh, transformation is what is funding our ability to accelerate EVs. And I think, you know, again, um, I think some people look at it simplistic and say, well, just mandate it. OK, you're leaving a lot of people out. We've got to make this transformation in an equitable fashion uh, and not cause further divide and haves and haves nots. And. And that's how we're looking at it. And it goes all the way from, you know, having affordable new vehicles. There's some people who never buy a new vehicle, having a robust used electric vehicle market. And then for people who choose not to own a vehicle, uh, cruise automation is a, uh, you know, cruise with the origin is an uh, all electric vehicle. And, you know, changing the way that ride share will happen, taking the cost down and opening up, you know, for people who can't afford uh, ride share today because it's on average about two fifty a mile to three dollars a mile. If you get that cost uh, below a dollar, you start to then create a, a mode of transportation that's zero emission. You know all those levels. You are touching everyone, and that's the way we think about it. And how broadly I think we all need to think about it if we're going to make this transformation as quickly as possible. Um, so. Uh... So the, uh, the market has responded favorably to uh, uh, GM's actions in this past year. So presumably the, the, the financial community feels like you've got a, you've got a good plan here. Um, 
the the conversion to electric is under your control. I mean, it's it's your your engineering and your design and and your ability to to execute around production. Uh, but there's infrastructure that isn't so directly under your control. So, how do you feel about the infrastructure challenges as you as you move the company in this direction? Um, and and what will it take to solve the 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 charging? the conversion from gas stations to charging stations. Sure. Well, we actually, again, see this as an in, uh, opportunity to innovate. And, you know, imagine how I think everybody's pretty used to with their smartphone, plugging it in every night. Think about um, the opportunity that we have to never need to go to a gas station again uh, because your your vehicle is charged, whether, and, and you know, clearly there's charging at home, there's charging at work, and we're, we're installing chargers in many of our work locations and encouraging other companies to do the same. Then you need charging, you know, point to point when you're on a longer journey. So at General Motors, like I said, we're making investment at our, our work sites. We're, uh, we're also uh, working with, there's a, many, many companies that are working on the, the public charging infrastructure. And we just announced, I think in the last day or so, that we're working with many of these companies to create a network where instead of, you know, I've got to, you know, sign on to five different systems uh, that it's all comes in through one app on your phone associated with your vehicle where you can know there's going to be a charger there for you when you get there you can reserve it and you can pay for it with you know one one hitting one button on your phone i think that's the world that we're moving to um, so corporations need to take action uh, uh, there's a lot of startups and companies dedicated to this but then also when you look at what the what congress and the administration is talking about from a, a broad infrastructure package making sure charging is a part of that i think is important as well so Again, I think this is every, it's going to come together. There's also work being done by energy companies. So many people are working together. We just have to knit it together in a way that is better for the consumer and do it quickly. So uh, uh, the, um, the, the other thing that uh, you've been focused on is uh, autonomous cars. And so uh, this has been this has been challenging to get people to feel confident about the safety of these cars. Uh, what tell us what what do you think are the remaining barriers to moving in this direction? Well, I'm really proud of Cruise, uh, the company that's majority owned by General Motors. The work that they've been doing um, is just extraordinary. And I think uh, Dan Ammon, who's the CEO of Cruise, will say, you know, we're start solving one of the most technolo difficult technological challenges of our generation, but it can be solved. And I see they continue to improve and hit milestones. We are actually testing in San Francisco right now without a driver. And I'm not going to, you know, make a prediction of exactly when the, you know, the business will launch, but we don't think it's years away. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's more can be measured in quarters. And, uh, and again, this is getting the uh, autonomous vehicle to safer than a human driver in, you know, it'll start with a geofenced area and then continue to grow as the vehicle costs come down and the vehicle capability increases, uh, you know, over time solving tunnels, solving black ice. Um, but I, I truly believe with the progress that I've seen in the, you know, just a few years really at Cruz that it can be done and it will be done. And, and frankly, you know, I know people are worried about, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about an autonomous vehicle. I have to tell you, I've now been in an autonomous vehicle several times. And I think what we need to do is then get people in these vehicles because five minutes in, you're pretty, um, you become pretty comfortable because you can see what the vehicle's doing. And, and remember, uh, an autonomous vehicle uh, doesn't drive impaired. It follows all the local laws. The minute, think about when you're, I, one of the things I like to tell people to think about is what is you're driving and you're coming into an intersection. Do you always see that yellow light the minute it turns or the second it turns yellow? Now you see it at some point. Well, the autonomous vehicle sees it right away. So it knows, do I stay at pace and go through the intersection or do I need to come to, to a, an appropriate you know, and, and controlled stop? Where a lot of times a human driver is saying, hmm, it's yellow. Do I have enough time to make it? Am I going to kind of punch it and get through, or am I going to break hard and stop? Um, you know, uh, the the system in the vehicle that is the controlling the the movements of the vehicle it sees more than a human driver. There's camera and lidar and radar all around it to be making those decisions. So 
Um, I, I'm very excited about the technology. I, I think it is going to take us to a safer world because right now uh, in the United States, I think about 40,000 people lost their lives on the road last year. And conservatively, 90% of them were caused by human error. So um, you've led an incredible change within General Motors, and, and it is now considered, uh, after some period of, of dormancy, one of, one of the great companies in the world again. And so what, what can you tell us that you've learned the, in terms of the leadership skills needed to drive massive change? I think one is you've got to have a great team. And I really believe at General Motors, um, the leadership team we have, and then the entire General Motors team, I really feel like we've got the best team on the field. And I think what enables us to go fast is, is valuing diversity in its diversity of thought, experience, perspective. And as we make the big strategic decisions, it's not just me. I mean, I, I'm so grateful for the team that uh, I have the, you know, the opportunity to lead. But we get together and we really work and look at things from all different angles, and then you know, work to move the company forward in an aligned fashion. So, I, and I also think it's it's that belief. Um, it's kind of a yes, I can, as opposed to let's let's think about all the reasons, all the issues, but let's not think about all the reasons why I can't. Let's think about all the reasons we have to solve so we can. And it's a mindset change. And then, um, you know, coupled with that is empowering people. You know, one of the things I saw and, you know, just really reinforced is empower people and get out of their way and they will do extraordinary things. So uh, as, you, as you continue to execute on this very ambitious vision, what are, what are the things that keep you up at night in, in terms of your ability to, to get there? Well, of, of, you know, of course, um, there's, always, there's, always, there's always challenges and opportunities. And uh, you know, I think the, the one area, I, I truly believe we have the right strategy. I know we have the right team. Will we alter the strategy as we learn more, of course, but you know, I think we can be agile and do that. So that, you know, the big thing, if, you know, when I talk internally, it's about speed, um, because not only is the automotive industry with the traditional players very competitive, very capable, but now there's a whole bunch of new companies thinking, you know, this is a business they're going to be in, and we can't underestimate any of them. So doing it well, doing it right, but doing it at a quick pace, so speed matters, is probably, um, you know, what keeps me up at night. So uh, I'm going to ask, ask you two more questions because sadly we're running out of time. And the first one is what, you know, having accumulated all this wisdom and insight and capability, uh, what would you tell your younger self at the, at the front of your career that, that would make you uh, more effective in your career journey? That's just a fancy way of saying what advice do you have for our students who are at the front end of their journeys so that they can benefit from all of your accumulated wisdom? Well, I think one is um, believe in yourself. And then as my mother taught me, work hard. You work before you play. Um, uh, find something you love doing because you're gonna you know, just be happier doing it. And then you know, put yourself out there. When you get offered an opportunity to do something, you know, I, everyone you know, I, I find today as they're graduating from college or grad school, they've got a plan. And that's great and you should have a plan. But don't be so tied to that plan that when that great opportunity comes along that's slightly off plan, but is a great learning opportunity, a broadening experience, if it makes your stomach a little, you know, you get a little mm feeling, those are the jobs you should take. So find a reason to say yes uh, instead of the you know the reason to 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 decline because that's when you grow and you prove to yourself how much more you can do than you thought. So uh, it's really about putting yourself out there. Uh, you know when when you're offered an opportunity to interview for a new job, you know this is an issue with women. A lot of women say, oh, there's ten requirements. I only have nine. I can't apply. We've learned a lot of times men will say, I've got six. I'm going to go for it. And my message to women is, go for it. You know, because even if you don't get the job, you're going to learn more. You're, you're going to learn from being in the interview process. You'll learn if you didn't get it, what you need to do to develop and or you might just get it. And so um, it's, it's kind of go for it, but do something you love and work hard. OK, so last question, I, I assume that 
uh, that that all of your cars and trucks are, are kind of like children, right? You, you can't say one is your favorite. Uh, and so having said that, you rotate through all of these uh, General Motors products. What's the one that's hardest for you to turn in? Oh, you know, I um, right now I'm driving a, uh, it's actually a, we call it captured test fleet. It's right before we start selling to the public. I'm sell, driving a Chevrolet Bolt EUV. And I am absolutely loving it. Um, you know, I think most people, if you haven't had the opportunity to drive an electric vehicle, it's instant torque. It's so much fun. It's so quiet. So um, I, uh, I already know the next, I'll have another one uh, opportunity to drive that going forward. But you know, you're absolutely right. Ever since I had the opportunity to run global product development, I feel like every vehicle plays a special role in our portfolio. And I know every vehicle, whether it's a, you know, a new Chevy um, Trailblazer that is a great vehicle for a lot of people as their first vehicle to a, you know, a full-size truck that you know, is part of someone's livelihood, these vehicles play a really special role in everyone's life. I mean, I get letters from, from consumers. I just got one today from someone who took a picture of their odometer of their truck turning over 300,000 miles. And they told me, and this truck is going to keep on going. And so, you know, one of the special things about being in this industry is we get to have that special part of someone's life. Uh, you know, they write songs about vehicles. I, you know, I get letters, people name their vehicles. And so it's, it's, a, it's a privilege. And that's why I don't have a favorite because I know each one of our vehicles plays a very important role and is special to someone. Well, Mary, thank you so much for playing a special part in our lives and, and truly in the lives of so many uh, in this country and around the world. Uh, you, you have earned many times over our, our highest accolade, which is leader of consequence. Uh, we're so grateful to you for doing great things and doing them in the right way. Um, it, it's just you're providing a wonderful example of how to how to be a leader in this very complicated world that we live in today. So many, many thanks for once again joining the Duke community. Well, I am I'm here, but I, I have to say I, it's not me. I'm representing a great team of people at General Motors and a great leadership team. But thank you for the opportunity, Bill. It's always wonderful to talk to you uh, and uh, spend time with Fuqua. So thank you so much. Be well.